Welcome to my channel. I'm Scott and if you want to catch my newest video, I post one every day. In this video, I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Canadian National Railway stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Canadian National Railway is a Canadian Class 1 freight railway. It is headquartered in Montreal, Canada. It serves Canada and also parts of the United States, the Midwest and Southern parts. CN is Canada's largest railway, spanning 20,400 miles of track. In the late 20th century, the company gained extensive capacity in the U.S. by taking over other railroads. This company trades on the NASDAQ. The ticker is CNI. We're going to look at the ticker that trades on the Toronto Stock Exchange. Let's get started with the model. This is a large cap company, 96 billion market cap. They're trading at 135 a share and they have 712 million shares outstanding. Let's look at the financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So the company has lots of free cash flow each year, two to $3 billion. Net income is the profit and loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And that decreases each year from five and a half billion to three and a half billion. Revenue is the sales for the company. And that grew a lot from 2017 to 2019, but then slipped a little in 2020. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue, the sales. Below that is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. Below that is gross profit. And that was the lowest in 2020, but it's pretty consistent year to year. Below that is operating expenses, then operating income. It does look like in Yahoo Finance, they have negative operating income in 2020. They did have positive in prior years. Below that is the interest they pay in their debt. Then there's other income and expenses but they do have positive pre-tax income. Sometimes Yahoo Finance doesn't pull in all the details, so they may be missing something. But the bottom line of the income statement is their net income, and that was three and a half billion dollars. It seems to be going down each year. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. Then you have capital expenditures, which are investments in property, plant, and equipment. Operating cash flow minus capex gives you your free cash flow. And this company has lots of free cash flow left over. So they can do a lot of things with that. They could pay a dividend, they could buy back stock, they could pay down debt, or they can reinvest back into their business. The company does pay a dividend, but it does look like they're also buying back stock. They bought back two billion in 2017, another two billion, 1.7 billion, then 400 million. When companies buy back stock, it decreases the shares in the market, making the remaining shares more valuable. They also seem to be adding debt each year. In 2017, they issued 916 million and paid down 841 million. They did not add much debt in 2017, but in 2018, they added a billion, they added more than a billion in 2019, and they added half a billion in 2020. Let's look at their operating cash flow. And the way you calculate that, you start with net income, that was three and a half billion. Then you have to add back the depreciation that brings down your net income, but you have to add back all non-cash items on the CFO section. That was 1.6 billion. They also had half a billion of deferred taxes and some other smaller items. So even though they reported a three and a half billion dollar gain, they actually generated $6.2 billion of cash flow. Net income is accounting profit and loss. Operating cash flow is your actual cash. So when you look at a company, you should look at operating cash flow. That's a better indicator of a company's health than net income. And they did have their highest operating cash flow in 2020 with their lowest net income. Let's look at a capital structure, $20 billion of equity, $13 billion of debt. They're 60% equity, 40% debt. And their net debt is 12.6 billion. Their WAC is 6.5%, and that's a discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four, that's $82 billion. 
we discount those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $75 billion. We divide that by 712 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of 105. The trading at 135, so the trading at a 29% premium. It's a sell according to the model. Simply Wall Street values the company at 118. They're also saying it's overvalued, just not as much as me. So the stock has pretty much only gone up the past few years. It did take a little dip back in March, but it's come all the way back up past its all-time high. It looks like it's come down a bit in the past couple of weeks. They do raise their dividend a little each year. They're up to 58 cents a share. That's a 1.7% dividend yield. To calculate that, it's annual dividend payment over market cap. Or you can take the last four dividend payments, sum them up, and then divide by the stock price. They pay out 46% of their net income and 50% of their free cash flow. They have a really low beta, 0.6, so the stock moves about half the market. The stock has a very low volatility. The stock has gone up 5% in the past 52 weeks, much worse than the S&P 500. The 52 week low was 92, the high was 149. And the stock is trading below its 50 day and 200 day moving average. So it seems to be on a downtrend. About 1.3 million shares are traded each day for this stock. And of the 712 million shares outstanding, 608 million are on float. Three quarters of the shares are held by institutions and less than 1% of the shares are shorted. If you invested $10,000 into this company 10 years ago, you would have been better off holding as long as you could because the stock has already tripled up to $35,000. That's a really good return on investment. Cascade Investment owns 14%, then MFS owns 5%, then Wellington, Vanguard, and TCI. Let's look at the financial ratios. The average PE in the market is 11. The median is 14. PE is stock price over earnings per share. To calculate earnings per share, that's net income over shares outstanding. They're 27, so investors are paying $27 for $1 of earnings. Price to sales is stock price over sales per share. They're at 7.0, which is a little better than the average. Price to book is stock price over book value per share. They're at 4.9, which is between the median and average. And the way you calculate book value per share is equity over shares outstanding. Equity is assets minus liabilities in the balance sheet. And they have 20 billion of equity, 19 billion of tangible equity because they have 400 million of intangibles on their balance sheet. Interest coverage ratio is EBIT over interest expense. They can easily cover their interest payments. ROE is net income over equity. They're at 18%. They have a really good ROE. Current ratio is current assets over current liabilities. They cannot cover their current liabilities with their current assets. They're a little shy. And their current assets are 569 million of cash, a billion of receivables, and half a billion of inventory. It does appear the company has sufficient funding to run their business. They did have over 3 billion of free cash flow in 2020. They're a little shy in working capital, negative 172 million. And they have a $1.6 billion dividend payment. If they have a similar free cash flow in 2021, they'll have an extra $1.5 billion on hand. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to similar companies, I've done videos on Canadian Pacific and National Express, both in the same industry as Canadian National. And if CN has a number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in green, they're better than the average. So they're better in PE because the average is negative. They are worse in price to sales and price to book. They have the best current ratio of the three companies, even though it's below one. They're about average in ROE. They have the lowest debt of the three companies, and they're the biggest of the three companies. They also pay the highest dividend. So to summarize, I do have them trading at a 29% premium, but this stock can always be a buy. This company plays a very important role in Canada. I ranked their free cash flow as eight out of 10, and they had the highest amount in 2020. I ranked their revenue six out of 10. That did drop a lot in 2020. I ranked their ratio seven out of 10. They're pretty good. The only thing is their current ratio is below one. Their price multiples are pretty good. They're not amazing, but they're good. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.